Okay, so good evening, everybody. My name's Chet Donnelly. I'm a spine surgeon here in my hometown of Dallas, Texas. And sometimes I jump onto these live sessions, maybe for about 20 minutes at a time or 30 to go over different spine topics. I used to only do it at night. I probably haven't done a nighttime one in years and years. Not that I've been doing it for that long, but at least a couple of years. Uh, so this is a nice treat. I know it's kind of just a different audience in the evening than Usually it's Saturday, Sunday afternoons. So looking forward to seeing some new people. And uh, I can see a lot of people are connecting and already giving some feedback and some comments. So I'll get to different comments here as we go along. And again, the theme and the topic I really want to highlight today is it's called spondylolisthesis. And essentially what spondylolisthesis is, it's just a big fancy doctor word for when one bone is sliding forward on the other. And that inherently can start pinching the nerves. So what do I mean by that? This is a spine model. So it could be the neck, but usually we're talking about the lumbar spine. But if this is the neck, it goes bone, disc, bone, and this disc space on the back part. So again, neck or lumbar spine. If you're looking down the canal, these are all the nerves run. And if you read your MRI or you just hear the word neural foramen or foramen, a big fancy word, I think it means hole through bone or hole through something is like the Greek part of it, but that's where these nerves come out. So spondylolisthesis, there's six types. I'm not going to list every type, but the two most common types, and the type that we see all the time, is either the ismic type, which is another dumb fancy word for a fracture. It's like this bone. So this is your lumbar spine. This bone fractures on the back. That's from repetitive hyperextension. That's the ismic type of spondylolisthesis. And then the other very more, more common type is the degenerative type. And that's where probably the majority of people watch and have that also. And that's where if you have these joints on the back called the facets, these are the facet joints, they get arthritis. And it's almost like if your knee joints normally kind of moving back and forth, and it gets a lot of arthritis, it grows and you know, it kind of dislocates in a way is a way to think about the degenerative type of spondylolisthesis. So what I want to focus on here is kind of getting to your questions on those topics, answering misconceptions, and then talking about like, what is the cure for that? And then cure is like a big word, right? Are you talking about fixing that forever? Well, actually, yeah, maybe for real. Is that fixing your entire spine? No. I mean, you got five or six, depending on how you're counting bones in your lumbar spine alone, but it's extraordinarily reliable. If you have something called an ismic spondylolisthesis, that's unstable, meaning it moves from flexion to extension and it's causing shooting down pain. You're bone on bone. You've tried all the non-operative stuff, which we'll go over, and you get a one-level spinal fusion to fix that. Extraordinarily reliable to fix that. And curing that level is a reality. You're curing the spondylolisthesis. You're reducing it back. You're opening the nerve tunnels, and you're eliminating the pain generated from those pinched nerves at that level. Now, look, is there a component of, you know, could you have chronic nerve pain already because you waited too long? Could you have a foot drop? Cause you never got it fixed and that never got better. Sure. So can you fix those things from that surgery? Well, sometimes it's hard to repair chronic nerve damage. That's why in different cases we advocate for surgery versus advocate for watching it until it needs surgery. And that's, what we're going to get over. So with that, I'll take a little break right here. I'm going to try to get to some specific questions and then I have a whole, uh, many little schedule I'm going to go over. I've gotten some good feedback from some of my patients that say they don't like me kind of just going random, but I'll go in order. So I'll do some questions here and I'm going to jump to the degenerative type and I'll jump to the ismic, my more favorite type of spondylolisthesis. So we'll kind of go from there. And again, there's probably about a thousand people in all the different platforms. So sorry if I don't get to it. And I see a lot of, um, I can't confirm or deny if they're patients, but people saying that they had surgery with me saying really nice things. So I do encourage you all to reach out to those people in the comment section because, you know, they can kind of validate what's going on. So question here, I see, um, Again, they come in so fast. So have you dealt with anyone with cauda equina syndrome? Yeah, many times. You know, obviously, yes, training residency, you see that a lot more often because that's more of a trauma setting. It's more of a trauma diagnosis. You can have chronic cauda equina, which is like a long-term or acute. Acute cauda equina is what I more so deal with is when you have a massive disc herniation or infection or pus, something that just immediately over the span of hours or days squeezes the cauda equina, this lower part of the spine, causes bladder dysfunction, bowel dysfunction, and that's a surgical emergency, if not if not a surgical urgency and something you want to get to uh, urgently. So for sure. Question from 
Cashmere, how long do you recover from a lift with posterior instrumentation? Well, I don't, there's a lot of ways to do that and a lot of ways that patients come in, but in general, patients start to feel a lot better five or six weeks later. And that's not a short period of time, but it's a big surgery. It's something where an a lift is when you go through the belly, A for anterior, going through the front. And I'll tell you why you do that. That's a great way to do it. But a lot of people aren't able to do that just in terms of the uh, facilities that they have built in or maybe they're a doctor surgeon that only goes to an ambulatory surgery center so they just don't do a lifts well, that kind of sucks they're missing out but um an a lift's a great way to do it so what's the recovery from it look in terms of like getting back to running jogging shooting guns wrestling that could be six months down the road but for real you're feeling it hurts like i'm not trying to you know i do painful surgeries for sure for sure for the first several weeks but many, many, many of my patients, they get a one level, two level A lift with posterior screws in the back. You know, they tell me they're cursing my name for those first couple of weeks. And then when I see them, you know, we see the two weeks, then around the five weeks, six weeks, they start to feel a lot better. They start to start saying, hey, now I feel like I'm like really starting to get there, feeling the benefit. And that's when we start formal physical therapy. So let me clarify that for the first six weeks, I don't want you doing much. You can go walk around the block, shower you can ride a bike if you want like stationary bike um help out around the house but don't do too much at six weeks is when we start doing stuff that's when you can take off your velcro back brace i've given you or how do you go by if you have united healthcare they don't cover back braces because they're evil so you have to go buy one even though you've paid god knows how much for your insurance but different side note and at six weeks you discontinue that velcro back brace you uh start formal physical therapy two times a week for six weeks I let you lift up to 15 pounds and then you get to three months. I let you go up to 45 pounds, six months. Um, usually take off all restrictions. We kind of just see how things are going at that point. Um, so that's kind of like in short what the recovery is. Now, look, I have some patients that are 75, diabetic, high BMI. You know, they don't recover as fast because they have a lot of factors that we can't necessarily control for. A couple questions here, then we get back to the topics. Why is joint replacement not a good alternative to fusion with spondylolisthesis? Could you do a joint replacement above and below a single level spondylolisthesis with fusion for adjacent disc disease? Uh, man, it's kind of confusing. Uh, joint replacement is an alternative in some cases, but if you have spondylolisthesis and instability, the gold standard is a one level fusion. If you don't have instability, you probably, in many cases, could just do a laminectomy. So if you're debating between a laminectomy and a joint replacement, do the laminectomy all day like joint replacement is very invasive and i don't know if i'm gonna say it's experimental but i don't know there's there's a lot to say on a recorded line about what i think on joint replacement and again there's kind of two types of well now there's even more there's different joint replacements there's a disc replacement which technically is not a joint replacement and there's joints facet replacements like the tops the modus and those things are a little different i got mixed thoughts about either of those and you know, it's something where, unfortunately, cash is king. And if you got enough money, you can find a surgeon to do the surgery you want. And that's sometimes a good thing or sometimes a really bad thing. I'll just kind of leave it at that for right now. And we'll kind of come back to that stuff later on. So in general, um, is joint replacement not a good alternative to fusion? I know I'm just reading your thing. I know it's not, it's confusing English there, but um, it's joint replacement could be a better alternative fusion. It just depends on many factors, the radiographs, the MRI, the patient and the condition, but for real one level fusion at five, one is what I would have. If I had a parse fracture and a spondy that was mobile all day, wouldn't even consider that other crazy stuff in terms of like double replacements and all that stuff. Um, Okay, so let me kind of get to a couple more things. I see Junebug Dragons, and again, I'm just reading these names as they come in, asking questions. So saying my thighs are numb, um, below the knees, I feel like being stabbed. How does it usually take for the nerves to heal better? So after a surgery, you know, actually after surgery, usually most patients feel pretty darn good for those first couple days, just the nerve pressure coming off. And then there's a process called re innervation pain that's pretty darn common in the first couple weeks after any type of surgery. And essentially what that is those nerves have been compressed for so long. And like, how do these nerves survive? Well, there's like blood vessels that kind of grow on them in a way, spinal fluid that helps give them inter like nutrition. I think of it that way. When they're compressed, none of that's happening. So when you open it up, well, what happens then? You start growing blood vessels on them. You start getting more spinal fluid from them and they depolarize, like shoot their signal 
think of it that way at a different rate, at an inappropriate rate, and you're not used to it. And maybe it's more than you should be getting sent through there. And so that's kind of what re innervation pain is. So after surgery, it's unfortunately pretty common to get shooting down nerve pain on either side. And that's something that uh, hurts. That's something that gives you altered sensation. But great news, we got medications for that. That's where you medrol dose packs, gabapentin, medrol. Um, sometimes in those first zero to six weeks, kind of let that calm down and kind of get you past that point. Okay, so with that, let me kind of jump into the degenerative type of spondylolisthesis. So that's the type where in the lumbar spine, can be in the neck also, these joints get so much arthritis that the bone starts shifting forward on the other bone. Additionally, when that bone is shifting so inappropriately, it wears out this disc space and you start getting significant foramenal nerve tunnel stenosis. Big fancy word for thickening or thickening of the joints that then go into the nerve tunnel. Let me say that one more time and I'll talk about the treatments. Again, so if here's your neck, if the joints start getting a lot of arthritis, it's like in the back part, that's kind of, you know, it hurts your neck, hurts your back, but like maybe not, maybe it's fine. It goes into the muscle, fine. But when it starts growing into the nerve tunnel and that thickened tissue, think of it this way. If you start working out or play golf a lot and get callus formation on your hand, that's kind of what arthritis is. Arthritis is God's way of protecting us. What do we do before we had arthritis? Well, you wore out your skin, got to the bone, got a bone infection and died of osteomyelitis. You know, it didn't really work like that necessarily, but I would think of it that way. So we have callus formation to protect the skin. That's kind of what arthritis is in a way of the joints. It's callus, it's adding tissue, and it's fine until it starts going into the nerves and squeezing the nerves and causing loss of function or pain. So that's what degenerative spondylolisthesis is. It's the wear and tear here, squeezing the nerve tunnels. Just having that condition does not mean you need to, does not mean you need to have surgery. Just having that condition does not mean you need to have a fusion or a replacement. In terms of the non-operative stuff, I'm going to focus that more on another topic. But in short, majority of patients do get better. Courses of physical therapy, steroid injections, anti-inflammatories, change in lifestyle, weight reduction. Those are things that hundreds of peer-reviewed studies have proven help patients. When people are like, I had steroids 10 years ago and now I need surgery, it didn't help. Okay, well, maybe it bought you 10 years. So I don't know if that's the best way to use that terminology. But a little bit of a different argument. So once you fail the conservative options, you might be a candidate for surgery. Who needs surgery? Just having pain every now and then doesn't mean you need surgery. It's when you can't interact with your family. It, degenerative, you're usually a little older, so I'm going to use grandkids. <clears throat> can't play with your grandkids. Can't go on cruises. Can't get up and down to block. The shooting pain is just debilitating you, and you know, you've got a good 20, 30 years left to live. It's worth getting fixed. Again, this is the degenerative type, so usually it's older patients. Okay, so what is the fix? Well, that's why, you know, I have patients all the time. I even got a one-star review on Yelp for this that send me MRIs but not x-rays. You got to have x-rays because the x-ray shows me your body straight on, and I look at the hip joints. That's a big part of being orthopedic spine trained is we understand hip pathology. And goodness gracious, I see at least two patients a week that tell me they have back pain, they haven't gotten it better, and I get I see their x-ray that they brought in and like they refuse to get x-rays because they're afraid of radiation, kind of a ridiculous argument. And it's cut off here. I get an x-ray. I see the hips. They have hip arthritis. And I'm like, I'm going to send you my best friend. He's up in Frisco, Chris Odom. He's going to fix your hip. And, you know, that l legitimately happens twice a month. Sometimes they're from out of state or to telemed. And then I just tell them to go see someone else. But for real, hip arthritis is a big deal for back pain. So x-rays are a big deal. The straight on view, the side view. The bending forward, bending back, flexion, extension, because I want to see what gravity does to your disc space. I want to see your spinal alignment. And importantly, here in Dallas, what I want to do is see how the bones move back and forth. I see someone's asking Frisco, am I in DFW? Yup, Dallas, homegrown, born at downtown Baylor, actually. So look, for all spine conditions, you need flexion, extension films. You need to see how the bones move. And in spondylolisthesis, <clears throat> You have stable and unstable. Stable essentially means those bones don't move. They kind of, maybe they're so bone